unpacking one of the most eventful and volatile weeks of the year and ethereum versus solana which one is better we cover all this right now in the collective shift weekly recap actionable insights and a breakdown into the crypto market all in under 30 minutes nick quite a volatile week wasn't it i think that's putting it lightly <laughs> it was one of the more volatile weeks you know since i've been in the space just from the sheer change in sentiment you know if you went away for the week you might not have you know, seen much has changed in the terms of price. That is how quickly things have rebounded. But perhaps you can get more into the market and exactly how fast or, or strong that rebound has been. Yeah, well said. I think over the seven days, you know, this time last week, you know, we were starting to see just the plummeting market. And I think hours later, it really got, uh, you know, into dangerous territory and everyone was panicking uh, with Bitcoin going below 50,000 US dollars for the first time in what feels like a, a very long time. And uh, to your point, rebounding very quickly in the days after actually getting back up to around 64, 63,000, I think was the local sort of peak from last week's chaos. And now at the time of recording, as you can see on the screen there, for those watching on YouTube, we're back now up at 7 to 8% for the past seven days for Bitcoin. ETH is up 10.5% and Sol is up 12%. So we'll unpack this a bit. I think a lot of a lot of you listening and watching would, would know that there's been a lot of chaos, of course, in the past week, which some of the reasons we talked about in last week's podcast. But just to really highlight you know, the, the main points, uh, it was definitely that, that Japanese sort of currency triggering a global market sell-off, which yeah we talked about, and I've got up on my screen here, but really just to give you a, a sign of, of how bad it was, you know, you had stock markets having their biggest sort of daily, you know, crashes for some of them for multiple decades. I think Japan, it was its worst day since 1987. Uh, and yeah, other, other stocks around the world really just crashing. And yeah, in crypto markets, that really translated to heavy selling, I think in particular because, you know, in, people could sort of see that this was going to happen once the stock markets opened on, on the Monday. And so people were quick to sort of sell their crypto as one of the most liquid accessible assets and you know, get out before the crash sort of ensued. And that's sort of what, what played out. Uh, yeah, well said, Matt. And I know just looking at the Japanese stock market, it rebounded. I think it's up, I think, before this uh, you know crash happened. So quick to rebound, uh, I think off the back of Japan kind of signaling that, hey, we might have to slow down, you know, rate hikes, which maybe we can get into that, uh, into this next segment here, looking into the fallout of what we learned from this really crazy week. Yeah, so as I posted for members, you know, last week, I just sort of explained why I thought uh, this was sort of more like a, t a technical, you know, pullback in prices, not so much, you know, a paradigm shifting sort of event. Um, it was pretty clear after doing a bit of reading and whatnot, that this was going to be all you know, unwinding you know, in a matter of days, or at least the bulk of it. There's still talks that you know, this, this carry trade will be unwinding for you know, maybe several weeks, but I think the market has sort of digested this news and we've got you know, a, a changing of attitude and language from the central bank in Japan, which sort of ticked a lot of this off. So in terms of like what happens next, um, it's it's obviously very hard to determine, but I think the, it feels like the worst of it's over. Of course, the post last week for members was, was on the day of everything happening. And I will be doing the same again if there's anything else that's like really serious. Uh, but in terms of the fallout, you know, there was some talking points here. I think um, there was a lot of, again, just a, a really great, I suppose, illustration of the potential for decentralized finance. Um, or DeFi. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, all of the protocols really you know, withstood the very high volatility and, and a lot of liquidations were happening and just chaos. They were all able to withstand that and have 100% uptime. And the same couldn't be said for a number of major online brokers, uh, just a few names of ones that experience you know, performance issues or even outages entirely. Charles Schwab, uh, Fidelity, Vanguard, and some other large brokers all having outages. So it sort of just highlights, uh, I suppose, one of the appeals of, of DeFi is that it can withstand such you know, chaotic times in the market. Mm, yeah, no, uh, Hayden Adams from Uniswap had a good tweet, which is one of my favorite ones there, just kind of looking at 
Surely there's an alternative here. <laughs> uh, of course, crypto doesn't quite do the level of transaction volume that you know these traditional yeah. players do. So we take it with a grain of salt. But you know, it's kind of a signal that we are in that way. And I saw, I think, Lido, STE, D, DPEG a little bit. I think in one of its more, I think to 98 cents, I think it was. But it was really quick to rebound along with a lot of the DeFi market. And I think Aave posted one of its best results because they printed money in that situation with revenues due to the cascading liquidations. So that worked as intended. And uh, you know, Aave was one of the big winners from all this, actually. Uh, another key point here that I kind of learned was, uh, hey, Bitcoin dominance really started to soar with a lot of the altcoins selling off at this time. Uh, as we do see with a lot of volatility, Bitcoin tends to hold up a lot better than altcoins when they're trading off. Uh, so we're hitting at about, I think, three year highs for Bitcoin dominance. And that's Bitcoin share of the, of the total crypto market heading at about 58%. So this is a key metric I look for in terms of gauging a lot of alt season to come and whether that appetite is going to come back because this tends to top uh, and then altcoins start to eat into that market cap. And then once we start to see that shift, it's a real, I think, paradigm shifting there when we start to see hey, attention starting to or money starting to transfer out of Bitcoin into some of these altcoins. So that's going to be a key figure that I look for. And I wonder how, how high Bitcoin dominance does get until we see that trend reversal. Yeah, good inclusion there, Nick. And speaking of Bitcoin, there was you know, talks about, well, if this is, you know, if Bitcoin is so great and it's a hedge against, you know, inflation and just things going wrong in the in the traditional finance, as Larry Fink you know, famously said, I think a, a month or two ago, uh, people would think that its performance would do well during times of chaos, but we saw it, you know, really suffer. Um, and I think, again, as I sort of alluded to earlier, I think it's again as simple as it's as simple it's as simple as people just viewing cryptocurrencies today as like a very risky asset and almost in a way its big benefit of being extremely liquid was it's to its detriment in 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 this isolated incident because it was so accessible people were quick to like look to sell their cryptocurrency to get cash knowing that there was going to be some pain in, in traditional markets but it was a talking point that came out of this I still think over time like the benefits of it being like 24 seven um and operating just yeah on weekends public holidays and things like that will over time prove to be like very beneficial and a reason why it gains adoption that is bitcoin as well as just you know public blockchains overall uh but yeah it was a, a talking point for sure that came out of this uh, i think that my my final lesson was probably just like reaffirming the changing sentiment that we're starting to to see especially as we head into the bull market or you know maybe a, a return to those all-time highs that we saw earlier in the year uh you know when we saw the fear and greed index hit i think it's the lowest point even hit a lower point than the ftx collapse and so hit the lowest point in july 2022 just after terra luna collapsed that's really saying something in in terms of how fast the market does move and why it's just so important to kind of stay rational and try and ignore a lot of this nonsense that's going on and people calling for you know, lower 40,000 Bitcoin. I saw poly market. I think it was actually pricing in almost half of everyone was expecting the price of Bitcoin to fall below 45,000 into 40s, which is telling a lot. And I think it just says a lot about trying to stay calm in this market volatility and trying not to get too caught up in maybe overanalyzing how the crypto market's going to go, or where it's going to go lower. You know, we can always ask for low, but you know, at the end of the day, we we just see that the macro still has a big impact on cryptocurrency. And if you look towards the long term fundamentals, and has anything really changed? I think that was the core thing we relayed to members this or last month was nothing really changed, as you said in your post. So that was probably the clear message that hopefully members you know was able to get a bit more comfortable and maybe years past people might have panicked a bit more but mm. i think people are realizing that hey it was more of a macro thing than a real crypto specific sell-off yeah that's it i think some days it's just best to you know stop looking at the portfolios particularly for longer term investors out there if you know you're not going to be selling anytime soon like I even fall into this trap over, over the years and I still do like it in these days, to be honest, of just checking the portfolio, even though I know I'm not going to be selling anytime soon. Sometimes 
it can be all consuming when there's you know chaotic days in the market so it can be best to just turn the screen off and yeah focus on other things but yeah we'll keep in touch on terms of market updates if there's anything really volatile this week uh but for now we'll move on to some more you know fundamental news that again is a big sort of shaping the rest of this bull market uh in our opinion and that is morgan stanley so one of the largest sort of investment banks in the world there was reports that they were going to start you know opening up their well bitcoin etfs letting certain financial advisors uh offer a select few sort of bitcoin etfs to clients uh this is one of the big stories of 2024 we've talked about it a lot in terms of the market you know like in our opinion just not appreciating how limited these bitcoin etfs are in terms of access And that's only going to continue improving throughout the rest of this year and into 2025 as well, given how slow moving, you know, a lot of traditional financial firms are. So what was the news? It was, I suppose, more confirmation of those reports from a couple of months ago, uh, where all of a sudden, you know, advisors working under Morgan Stanley, so I think there's about 15,000 globally uh they can start you know act- actively sort of i suppose advising that their clients you know get exposure to these bitcoin etfs sort of when necessary so they sort of had to hit certain criteria so it's not like they can go out there and shield these bitcoin etfs to everyone but it's a great start and it's a, it's a, it's the only start it was ever going to be these stepping stone sort of approaches so this is a big story to watch because uh, reportedly, like most of the sort of advisors out there and brokers who are offering these ETFs um, still uh, can only do it in an unsolicited manner. So the client needs to do their own research, come to the advisor and say, hey, I want you to put 1%, 2% into the Bitcoin ETFs. And so Morgan Stanley, I, from reports, is one of, if not the first sort of major investment banking giant to go to that next step. Uh, as we just explained. So really promising uh, progress there. And we'll see if that translates to more, I suppose, buy side demand for, for Bitcoin ultimately through these ETFs. Uh, that was a big one there. So also BlackRock, uh, I think their chief investment officer touted the exact same thing you were talking about, Matt, that, hey, we have to wait until 2025 to really see the full impact and these mm. things to get rolled out. Because that's the common, I think, myth that people don't realize that they still have training wheels on in a way. And it's not going to be in another 12 months until these things are fully rolled out and offered to even more asset managers and the like. Definitely. Um, in terms of like you know other important updates, for sure, we should talk about uh, what's happening in the, the US election race. Uh, it has to be talked about given how much of a swing things have happened in the past month. I know we're, we're trying not to get in the habit of making <laughs> this too much political, but you know you can't deny the impact that it's having on crypto markets. Uh, we saw Harris actually flip Trump on poly market for the first time this week. And it was kind of a really meteoric rise um, from Harris. He was, I think, trending at something like 5% when Biden was back in. So anyone who got on that on poly market doing very well for themselves. But as you put on the screen now, Matt, the, yeah, they've crisscrossed and now Harris is leading. This is huge, obviously, because of you know, Trump and the Republicans being seen as pro crypto, whereas the Democrats, although there's been a lot of talk about them opening up to crypto potentially and trying to harness that user base instead of alienating them, they still don't have any fundamental commitment to the cryptocurrency space. It's a very wait and see. So huge deal here. And I wonder how this goes. Uh, we talked about earlier in the office matter how the um, Clinton Trump race ended, you know, very close one. The polls got it wrong. Uh, a lot to play out still because uh, Clinton was leading considerably up until the election. So many months to go. Um, I'm not sure you're feeling here, Matt, if uh, you think Harris is true to their word that they may reopen to crypto, but I'm kind of very approaching it very cautiously to say it mildly. Yeah, when you look at like what the impact of this democratic administration has been on crypto, again, I think talk about things that the market underrates i also think the market underrates uh just how damaging or i suppose just it's almost like capping the growth if you will sure crypto is still grown with a hostile u.s administration like sure and we're bigger than just the u.s of course as we say many times but uh, when you think about what the crypto space could have been if we just had a neutral administration or even a pro-crypto administration which again trump is sort of 
speaking as if he will be that and JD Vance the, the vice president nominee again that you could argue is also just talk but it's a lot more favorable I suppose but yeah I agree with everything you, you said there Nick and we'll, we'll keep an eye on whether Harris's you know team is actually continuing to get involved and have discussions or it's not just a one-off sort of thing to get some nice publicity yeah perhaps uh, staying on the same Trump news there, uh, maybe Trump Jr. this time. <laughs> he kind of made news for touting a new DeFi platform. This was something that I didn't have on my 2024 bucket list in crypto. You know, Donald Trump Jr. talking about DeFi. This is yeah. very odd to me. Um, I'm not sure if you were following this one, Matt, but something around, you know, being anti-banks and very interesting uh, uh, development there. Talk about maybe it was a meme coin, but come out with, yeah, it was a DeFi platform, but maybe you can shed some more light on it. Yeah, it was really just like, again, all teasing at this stage, but apparently there's going to be some sort of project that Donald Trump Jr. is going to be a part of that's being announced soon that, yeah, sort of is to do with targeting those those banking relationships, which a lot of crypto industry participants have struggled with, particularly in the US. So, look, we'll, we'll see what that turns out to be. Yeah, there was also a meme coin sort of, you know, big saga last week, which they got sort of caught in and it was again very murky about who was responsible that sort of happened actually with the young the uh, baron uh, trump as well like i think in july and then a few weeks later now donald trump jr has got caught up in it as well so that's like a separate thing like sure that's its own thing we don't really talk about that but it's there um also this DeFi one i think is more i suppose of a potential talking point we'll have to see what actually is announced yeah my, my initial hunch it's maybe a, a, a bit of nonsense uh and maybe some marketing firm or you know trying to get together another pro crypto agenda or something like yeah. i'm not seeing there's a lot there you know we may be surprised and it could be significant but if it is i'm sure we'll talk more about it in the pod in the coming months yeah yeah well said we'll uh check in on you know, the Ethereum meetup, it sort of like has faded into the background, uh, background with uh, all the hysteria and market turmoil of last week. Uh, how have things been going on the Ethereum ETF side of things? Uh, there's been a lot of positive news, in my opinion, with the grayscale outflows starting to really trend, you know, towards those low uh, 10, 20 million figure uh, they hit their lowest figure since uh, the funds launched in you know, July 24. You know, so on August 8, they hit about 20 million of outflows, which was way down on you know, tens or hundreds of millions of outflows, which were happening very early on. So that's really encouraging to see. Another really encouraging point was BlackRock's ETH A ETF. They had like a day on August 6 where they had almost $110 million worth of value flow into it. And this follows another day on July 30 where they had 118 million and then you know a strong mm. couple first days. So really encouraging to see here because normally from what I've been hearing from a lot of the Bloomberg analysts is that appetite for these things can really start to trend downwards after the first couple of weeks. So this is really encouraging to see. And you know I think it's gonna say a lot to the demand for Ethereum if these ETFs still garner quite a lot of inflows. Um, we're still sitting at net 400 million outflows, really from the Grayscale ETF, which had in itself about 2.3 million worth of outflows. So we're still waiting to see how much of this is actually flowed into other products you know, when it's all said and done. But you know, a huge deal and final really note, noteworthy uh, thing I picked up here is there was only one of the Ethereum ETF products which had net outflows outside of Grayscale on any one day, which was Fidelity on August 8th, which was an outlier there of mi minus 2 million. So that was also an encouraging point to see that most of these funds are still inflowing and not outflowing, especially with the recent market sell-off. They actually saw more inflows than outflows. Yeah, it's hard to under uh, overstate that that last point there that that actually surprised me so yeah what nick's saying here is really the the diamond hands <laughs> the etf holders like which backs up what we've talked about previously with because of this unsolicited solicited thing the people who are coming and buying these etfs whether it's institutional or, or retail it's obviously both but they tend to be people who do their own research and aren't really shaken 
as much as the typical unsophisticated investor who's very reactionary um, because they don't understand why a price might be raging up higher or, or mm. plummeting. So to your point, we only saw one day in the midst of like a 20, 25% crash for ETH one of the particular products had a very small amount of net outflows uh, in, in amongst that chaos. So yeah, that's, that's really uh, noteworthy and we'll see if this all continues to trend higher now the grayscale outflows are, are slowing as, as you alluded to there. In terms of the another just big update before we get to our favorite part of the podcast, um, Russia is legalizing Bitcoin and crypto mining. So I think we touched on this the other month, reports that it was maybe coming up, uh, but we actually saw it, I suppose, voted in and it will become effective as of uh, November. So, yeah, people speculating, you know, why they're doing this. Is it to sort of, you know, circumvent uh, these restrictions, particularly the US has sort of put on them amongst all the Ukraine war. Um, it te- you'd think that that would be at least a reason. I'm not sure how much of a reason. Like we don't really <laughs> aren't privy to those discussions, of course. But um, yeah, we'll we'll see what happens there, and and if it gets so serious, I suppose to really you know if you you know take that example of them using crypto mining to get around sanctions, you know it could even unfortunately paint the crypto space in a in even a worse light from the likes of Elizabeth Warren and whatnot, who might highlight this uh, if there is proof that they're sort of doing this. But that's all speculation. We'll sort of see what what happens out of that. But yeah, Russia continuing to yeah get more involved in the crypto space. So getting into our altcoin updates now, uh, a huge one this week that I couldn't help but notice was Solana. Um, you know, held up very well compared to a lot of the other cryptocurrencies. There was a real few uh, highs that it made against Ethereum, even a bug that was patched that went under the radar. So not sure where you want to start here, Matt, but, uh, you know, ETH versus Solana. uh, I did a post for members this week, uh, which just went out today. Um, A lot to unpack here. And maybe we can start with Solana rebounding faster and, you know, better than the rest of the market. You know, that was the one thing I know you talk about a lot and maybe you mentioned in your member post was, we really want to watch who are the strongest rebounders from the sell-off because that tells us a lot about the strength and the appetite for that cryptocurrency. And Solana rebounded very strong compared to Ethereum and a lot of the other L1s in the market. Yeah, so it's, it's always important to, to watch this, even if you're not actively investing, at least to, it gives you a good sense of where the attention and well bids are. And arguably more importantly, even if you're holding an old altcoin, and it just just doesn't do well on a rebound. It's another sign that maybe the attention and bids have, have gone elsewhere. So it's always yeah, a number of reasons why it's important to watch uh, this time. You know, I think the big thing to highlight here is always comparing it to similarly ranked uh, altcoins because obviously the ones that rebound the most will be the riskiest, like meme coins, which is what happened this time but they also collapse the most amidst the, the chaos. But if you're ranking similarly, if you're comparing similarly ranked ones or even ones in the same sector, like this chart is here with Solana versus you know, Tron and a bunch of other layer ones, uh, that's a, a great way to sort of frame it. And you can see the purple line there of Solana just rebounding a lot more strongly than the others. In terms of uh, just other talking points here, uh, as you said, Nick, there was a bug uh, last week, which will go up on screen here, that um, the developers sort of were able to identify uh, and and patch in a coordinated fashion, which is you know often the case with Solana. So they got a super majority of the network state was patched before public disclosure. So there might be some more information that that has come out about that. But yeah, that was something that was happening amongst all the the market volatility. Yeah, I haven't seen any any updates yet as to like what this main issue was. I think it's being kept under wraps. Maybe, you know, a report will come out about it. But, you know, you can take this in two different ways. You can take it as Solana is still very centralized that, you know, the validators just got together again and we were able to instantly fix it, which is, you know, maybe not the best for being able to do more uh, maybe uh, negative things if they want to upgrade mm-hmm. it in a, in a bad light or turn back state, for example. But then it's also a wide positive that they were able to 
really move fast to fix a vulnerability mm. uh, you know, and not let it result in any downtime. So they were kind of tackling the issue before it came. And that was kind of a small win that came out of it that, hey, they didn't actually get any downtime, which we all know was one of the biggest overhangs for Solana and they were able to patch it relatively quickly and swiftly. So that was a real positive, I thought, Matt. Yeah, the fact this happened without downtime, yeah, very, very important there and keeps that that narrative going, which is, again, what is that narrative? It's just around Solana catching up to Ethereum in, in many ways. Obviously, you know, I think people still, we were talking about this last week, but I think the market and even just people in general, they still are ignoring the fact or not wanting to... I guess respect that Ethereum is still dominating Solana in a number of critical metrics. Um, of course, like TVL is by far the, the, one of the biggest ones there and, and just developer mindshare and I guess developer infrastructure and, and things like that. Um, but obviously Solana is catching up to Ethereum in many key metrics and it actually has overtaken uh, Ethereum in some of those you know, really I guess, high signal metrics, which is really great to see. And it adds to the sort of competition and the competitiveness in the layer one sort of landscape. And it's led to this debate around, again, just I think it's just people being bored in the in the sort of sideways price action, but people sort of trying to pick sides on yeah Ethereum or Solana. Is there sort of a way in your post that you sort of, I guess you could share with the audience, Nick, about just what your sort of main takeaway was. Yeah, so my main takeaway was, you know, hey, Solana is making new highs against Ethereum, just from like ETH, from Sol to ETH perspective in terms of you know, its price, and then let alone other core metrics like volume, but then it's losing out in other areas such as stable coins and you know, network effects that you mentioned. So a definite key here was that a lot of the people maybe talking highly of Solana, it's not, you know, um, it, it's founded in a lot of reality because a lot mm. of attention is in Solana. That was a key takeaway that maybe a lot of people in the Ethereum camp may not like to face. Mm. But the main conclusion is that, hey, they do, they're doing two, not different things, but they're doing it in different ways. Mm. You know, Solana is trying to solve everything in a neat, tidy package, basically. Yeah. Uh, the best user experience, so easy to get someone onto and then to engage and deploy an application. Uh, whereas Ethereum is more of that kind of layered approach. So it has its main hub, but then it's creating all these sorts of different types of software that's sitting on top of it that try and talk to each other and scale. So these things are very different. And you know, if Solana is able to scale nicely all in one package and the way that Anatoly and a lot of the Solana Foundation and Solana community think, then hey, that's really great. And, Sol and Ethereum may struggle you know, with its really convoluted L2s that haven't been abstracted yet. Uh, but then again, if uh, Solana isn't able to do that and Ethereum's way is better, if it's you know, gonna take a lot more to scale, uh, if it needs a lot of these extra networks and they can find a way to talk to each other and deliver a nice user experience, and hey, Ethereum might win. So it's, you know, in a way, they're hedged against each other, um, mm. especially with a lot of concerns over the main ETH cryptocurrency maybe not accruing as much value now, now that it's executing on its roadmap of you know, L2 scaling. So in a way, I just see these as so different that in a way, it's, mm. it would be hard to go all in on Solana and ignore Ethereum. I think that's, you know, a lot of people are, but you know, it all depends on, I guess, your risk appetite, how you view these things. And I, I view them as, as complementary, really. And there's probably a big enough market for a few major L1s. And I still think Ethereum is really tough to dethrone at this point in time. Although Solana's going to have a real red hot crack at it. And I think it's going to be a non-trivial amount of the market share it's going to continue to take and continue to retain. Yeah, great way to frame it. I think if you're in, if we're talking seven, eight, nine years from now, and we're still bickering about you know which one is there to take like majority of the market it's probably a sign that the market just isn't big enough in terms of like the addressable market of potential users and developers um i think that's also like something i've been taking away from from this debate um so i think there is definitely room for both um right. and they can both do very well in the future and both thrive as ecosystems hopefully otherwise if only one of them wins 
unless there's not some other outside competitor, which there very well could be, if only one of them is doing really well in seven, eight, nine years from now, it's probably a sign that you know, crypto hasn't come a long way, in my opinion. Yeah, I also think that it's if Ethereum is still very convoluted to use from a user perspective and a UI mm. a mindset in seven to, ten, seven to eight years, then there's no doubt Ethereum will be completely failed um, in, in its goal to actually get users mm. and you know tangible amounts of value on the network. If you know, so that's a way I look at it as well. Hey, this is a neon goal for Ethereum. It's kind of this in between where you're still an early adopter. Yeah. Because in the grand scheme of things, it's just had its ninth birthday. It's executing on some of the hardest things it's done, but there's still a long way to go really mm. into making it real user friendly. And I think that's perhaps where we're going to start to enter now that scalability is actually starting to be here and mm. that's probably not the bottleneck. Maybe the bottleneck now is the user experience and making sure that everything can talk to each other and the interoperability of these things of making sure everything chats and fits mm. nicely together like Solana's nice box that it wants yeah. to do. Um, is it able to abstract that? That's going to be the key thing to watch for, for my mind at least. Yeah, for sure. Just the last point here uh, is also just, I think the development, you know, cycles, I think was a big thing I took away from your article and just thinking about it more. Like the simple fact is Solana is basically what Ethereum was, you know, in this time in the last cycle. Um, and that counts for a lot. Like, what is that? What am I talking about? Like it talks a lot about upcoming catalysts. There's a lot more upcoming catalysts for Solana because it's younger. So it's got a lot more things for people to get excited about um you know all else sort of being equal you know you've also got things like the network effects which really are dominating by ethereum just because it's older and it's been around a lot longer so that that thing about looking for the, the even the next solana is something we'll keep an eye out as a team as well uh because there will be more competitors and maybe in the next bear market will be their opportunity to sort of grow a really strong and passionate ecosystem of developers and users yeah, because that's basically just upside, what we're trying to say here. And that was a key takeaway that obviously Solana probably is more upside because it's just a whole cycle younger than Ethereum. And it's market gut weighting is much smaller than Ethereum. So mm. it's leaving a lot more opportunity to capture and, and to grow, uh, you know, probably not expecting the same, you know, maybe returns or, you know, it to grow just as much just because the market cap would yeah. have to explode by much more for it to have those type of gains. So that's probably the main takeaway. Hey, so have a look at, what type of risk to reward you know you're probably looking for because that would say a lot about whether you know which one or both you know you you do want to have i guess yeah well so that's what it always comes back to for sure uh in terms of other big news in the old coin space uh ripple of course they were one of the big winners of last week even the xrp token really surging not for not for like just one random reason it was a big a big reason that we've been waiting for for a while i suppose as an industry and in the xrp holder base has and that is some closure or at least yeah almost closure with the uh the court finally ruling on and you know at least the initial court that was looking over it closing the book and giving out a final judgment on the ripple labs versus sec court battle that's been going on for a number of years now so technically speaking both parties won on on certain things i think the takeaway from the crypto community and even the lawyers in crypto space seen again you could say their incentives are warped or <laughs> their views warped but a lot of people gave the points to ripple uh, uh mainly the main sort of line of thinking was that uh to do with the fines so the pe civil penalties were one component of the judgment and they the judge gave ripple labs 125 million dollar fine mm -hmm. uh which was yeah like about you know 90 percent or so less than what the sec wanted which was around two billion uh which again many people thought was egregious um i think one thing i think i don't think it's worth celebrating too much just yet because it's almost guaranteed the sec will will put in an application to appeal that'll probably get granted and then we'll go through all the next processes of like yeah. of the legal reasoning behind programmatic sales and whether these institutional like transactions are securities and whether the retail sort of secondary market transactions um, are securities, which this judge last week um, essentially said those retail secondary market ones aren't securities. That was their interpretation, but the institutional side of things, um, the programmatic sales and whatnot are securities. So 
that on that side of things, I suppose the SEC quote unquote won from the, the programmatic sales side of things. But again, all this will come out, I'm sure, in the appeals court. And they, like a lot of these things, these are very influential court decisions and can have, I guess, precedence in other court decisions and can actually affect legislation once it does eventually you know, come through Congress and whatnot. It, I assume it will come up as arguments from, from lawmakers when they are making these, these laws that hopefully do come. But ultimately, whatever those laws are, are the biggest, most important thing to look at when you're talking about the outlook for crypto. So um, yeah, more to see there, but yeah, that good to see some closure there. But on Arbitrum quickly, Nick? Uh, our final altcoin news that I think we wanted to let our listeners aware of is, you know, Arbitrum, they hit an all-time low in the latest sell-off, which re- really marked a, a point in, in, the, in the Dow governance considering that they had high hopes and they still garner quite a lot of TVL. They're the biggest TVL mm. um, Ethereum L2. They're widely seen as the home for DeFi in the Ethereum L2 ecosystem, but they're really struggling at the moment. But despite you know the focus on price, there is some positive news in terms of the adoption front with Franklin Templeton and that really large asset manager. They launched an on-chain money, money market fund on Arbitrum. And this follows a similar announcement from Ubisoft games based, so they're going to be launching a game based on a Netflix series to launch on the network. So a few nice announcements here on the Arbitrum side, which comes at a time with the token hitting uh, all time low in the latest sell off. Yeah, thanks for for that update there, Nick. Uh, In terms of upcoming news, uh, nothing really this week or, or next week. There was, I think, you know, Trump is being interviewed by Elon Musk, I think, this sometime this week and people betting on poly market whether they'll mention crypto and whatnot. That's probably going to have a lot of the attention. But of course, yeah, the macro thing is still driving prices. Uh, in terms of rapid fire, overappreciated or underappreciated, what did you have this week, Nick? Uh, I had maybe the, the underrated attitudes of cryptocurrency. We saw that, hey, uh, the public attitude has increased quite a lot. Uh, and maybe people are considering that, hey, lawmakers have completely opened up the crypto now. But this isn't always the case with, uh, I think, Customers Bank that come out uh, and said that they have actually been ordered by the Fed to limit some of their risks and funds from digital asset clients uh, because of their links to cryptocurrency. This was, this was talked about as being called choke point 2.0. Essentially, it's just you know, government departments and the US are trying to choke and strangle and kind of debank different uh, financial institutions who want to service cryptocurrency banks and users. So this is a huge deal and really shows that, hey, their negative attitudes towards cryptocurrency in the US is still very much there. And no, I think nothing better describes this as the latest crypto meeting that a lot of crypto executives from Coinbase, from Uniswap, they group together in the White House to talk with uh, some Democratic leaders over maybe sh- reshifting the attitudes of cryptocurrency. In a, reports from one of the person who attended the meeting actually asked if uh, everyone could raise their hand if they experienced debanking in the cryptocurrency space, which was opposite to what I think one of them, <laughs> the people who were leading the meeting said. You know, they said that they didn't and they didn't actively debank crypto banks or customers. I think everyone in the room apparently reportedly raised their hands in that. So it's still maybe showing the tensions that exist. Um, Cryptocurrency is still very much being not treated fairly in the US financial system and still has a long way to go. And it's probably one of the real benefits that, hey, crypto has come this far, even with a current US climate that is struggling entrepreneurs to get banked and to launch their crypto companies in the US. Uh, If this gets resolved, who knows with the new election, then this could be a huge tailwind for cryptocurrency to only move higher once people aren't afraid to actually and can actually be banked in the industry in the US. Great. Thanks for that, Nick. We'll keep an eye on it. And for this week, well, will it be as eventful as last week? Uh, I hope not, but who knows? Who knows? We're ready if anything does happen. But for now, thanks everyone for watching or listening. And if you are looking for more insights, 
definitely check out the weekly shift newsletter providing free market insights every Friday straight to your inbox. So you can go and subscribe to that at collectiveshift.io forward slash newsletter. That's collectiveshift.io forward slash newsletter.